Good morning and happy Sunday. Welcome to our February 16th, 2020 service from La Jolla Presbyterian Church. Reverend Scott Mitchell is preaching this week and it's the sixth week of our winter sermon series titled Gospel Glimpses. It's a look at typology, the people, events, or places in the Old Testament that offer us a type or pattern of the Messiah who is to come. This morning, we're looking at God's instructions to the people of Israel on constructing the tabernacle. The sermon is titled, God in Our Midst, and it's a look at Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 through 9, and the Gospel of John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. If you would like to connect with our church, you can find our website at ljpress.org. We hope to see lives transformed by our relationship with Jesus. And we strive to be a place where you experience and are able to express that transforming love of Christ. And now here's Scott with God in Our Midst. Well, since the title of today's message is uh, God in Our Midst, I'd like to begin this morning by talking about presence, though perhaps uh, at the moment not a divine presence. One example of God's presence in my midst is also a reason for which, uh, whenever I'm at home, I never feel alone. Our cat, Buddy. Uh, Laura is with me, too, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, Lord bless her. <clears throat> but let me just stay with me here a minute as I talk about Buddy. The Lord is indeed in our midst and is, I believe, testing me. Buddy, our cat, is about 17 years old. We're not sure. We didn't get the birth certificate. And uh, he's lived through all of the coyotes, uh, in and around our neighborhood that none of our other cats did. And uh, rest assured, we did our best. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Buddy's presence may be with me right now. I don't know. <clears throat> <clears throat> we did our best to protect our cats, and we tried to make Buddy mostly an indoor cat, but uh, he, would, he would escape... Um, and stay out very often at night. Unlike the other cats that escaped out the door, Buddy always, always, always returned home. And uh, we grew to trust that Buddy would always return home. And uh, we've taken lately to calling Buddy, Buddy the Amazing. Just that, Buddy the Amazing. At some point several years ago, though, we, we stopped letting Buddy out at night or allowing it to happen. We insisted that he stay home, and and Buddy came to the place where he preferred that as well. But old cats indoors can develop bad habits. His stomach has shrunk, and so he can't eat a lot or else he'll get a little sick. And uh, so we end up feeding him every 45 minutes or so. And he can't always find a cat box. Um, But the most amazing thing and the most amazingly annoying thing about Buddy is that unless he is asleep, he walks around the house and meows nonstop. Now, maybe because he wants food and he's never quite filled up. I get that. Um, But until I leave for the morning, uh, for work in the morning, he's already been meowing ahead of time to send me on my way. And when I come home at night, the first thing I hear when they open the door is Buddy's meowing, greeting me. If we don't put him in the garage at night, he'll wake us in the middle of the night uh, or or too early in the morning and ruin our sleep. He'll just ruin it. Recently, I counted the meows. I tried to, you know, I was mid, he had already started, but I thought, I want to try to count these. So I got up somewhere to about 50 consecutive meows, and I... And I, as I say, missed the beginning, and there was probably a few more after that. Um, It's sort of binge meowing, I I guess you could say, Buddy's involved in. So whenever I leave for work, much as I love my family, I do have a sense of relief that (laughs) uh, that I don't hear the meows. Our children are grown, but Buddy makes the house seem like we are raising a newborn child again. He's always crying. He's always wanting food. He has no control over his bodily functions. It is deja vu all over again. Well, Buddy is old, and he obviously has some physical and probably cognitive issues related to his age. 
but the incessant, unending, non-stop meowing makes me suspect that God is speaking to me through our cat. (laughs) I honestly wonder if God is trying, anyway, to teach me patience and compassion. And Laura will tell you, of course, that it's been a hard sell. Um, God certainly comes into our midst through the words and the actions of our spouses, our children, our parents, our brothers, our sisters, our friends. Why not pets? God works in mysterious ways, and his presence abides very often where we least expect it. And God may be trying to teach me patience and compassion. So for a lot of reasons, pray for me. (laughs) Well, we have been traveling together uh, during this early part of the uh, year 2000, and our theme has been gospel glimpses. That is, how do we find in the Old Testament glimpses, snapshots of the coming Jesus Christ in the New Testament? And Pastor Paul has spoken in his sermons about this, this word typology, that is the study and the interpretation of correlating types and symbols in the Bible, particularly in comparison, the comparison of types between the Old and the New Testaments. Things that we find in the Old Testament, then we find echoes of in the New Testament. And so this morning we'll be looking at an Old Testament type of Jesus by way of the tabernacle in Genesis 25. And then we'll look at what it, uh, what it means to make a worthy offering to God. And then we'll explore the ways that we can invite God into our presence. So pray with me, if you will. Heavenly Father, be with us this morning. Open your word up to us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to be reading now a few verses, first nine verses from um, Exodus chapter 25. When I find my glasses, I am aging along with Buddy. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to take for me an offering from all whose hearts prompt them to give. From all whose hearts prompt them to give, you shall receive the offering for me. This is the offering that you shall receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and crimson yarns, and fine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram's skins, fine leather, acacia wood, oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrance, the fragrant incense, onyx stones and gems to be set in the ephod and for the breastpiece. And have them make me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them in accordance with all that I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all of its furniture, so shall you make it. So what is this tabernacle of which Exodus speaks? The institution of the tabernacle was founded at the foot of Mount Sinai a year after the Exodus. The tabernacle was essentially a wilderness sanctuary, a portable home for God's presence among the people of Israel while they sojourned in the wilderness before coming to the promised land of Canaan. And while When Scripture says that God tabernacled with his people, it means that God moved around in his sanctuary with his people, that God was mobile along with them because they were a wandering people at that point in time. And as the tabernacle of worship moved with Israel's sojourn, so God was portable in that worship space with them. The tabernacle was intended as an earthly representation of the heavenly reality of God's presence. So it was intended to be heaven on earth. It was meant to be a visible reminder of the hope of heaven and a new creation, a new, a new Eden, in a sense. Also, rather than these infrequent revelations of God from a, a distant mountaintop or a burning bush, 
Now God would have a regular local presence among the people. So granted, the tabernacle moved around as the people of God moved around. But why was it important for God to be in that tabernacle with his people in the first place? Well, God knows that if his presence is with us, we can better comprehend who God is. We can better grow in obedience to Jesus Christ in order to bring God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, as our Lord's Prayer says. God knows that since worship is a foretaste of eternity, we as God's creation should be allowed to taste heaven here on earth. God also knows that we can often focus better on God in a place of worship than outside a place of worship. Not always, but very often. We wouldn't gather each week if that were not so. God knows that being in a place set aside for worship, that can protect us from society's distractions and from its memes, if you will. In the sanctuary, you see the cross, not a billboard. Here, at least for a while, each week, you see and contemplate meanings behind the stained glass windows, the meanings behind our worship songs, rather than the meanings behind pop-up ads or the Super Bowl or political messages. And by the way, after the 845 service this morning, you can join our director of worship and arts, Ron Bowles, as he gives a tour, a guided tour of these stained glass windows at about 1015. So if you haven't done that already, stay around for that. You won't find that in any other places but here. Do we need to guard against a house of God syndrome? Absolutely. Absolutely. But a set place to worship is one of God's great gifts to us. You know, with all the claims these days that going to worship with other believers at a non-church setting like a bar, and there is a lot of that, uh, that's a more holy environment than the church because uh, supposedly God is more real in a bar than in a sanctuary. I've never agreed with that. Can there be holy moments in a bar? Absolutely. If God is everywhere, then God is in a bar too. Absolutely. Absolutely. But is a bar specifically set aside for us to come into God's presence in a special way? Not at all. Friends, several times a week, you can, any time during the week, you can come into this uh, sanctuary or into the chapel and you can pray. We can make that happen for you. Hear me now, I'm not, I'm not saying don't go to bars, don't go to sporting events, don't go to the theater or to all of those other places where we as humans congregate. Like you, I've been to all of those places. And you can definitely find holy moments in them. What I am saying, though, is that God meets us in a special way in a set-aside place of worship that is very different from all of those places. I had the deep privilege uh, a number of years ago of being the uh, pastoral liaison to the sanctuary building program when I was an interim pastor at the Village Church in Rancho Santa Fe. And what that meant is that every Thursday morning for about two years, I sat with the building committee, with the supervisors, the managers of the project, and various other people, and and we hashed out all kinds of details. At that time, I was working with the preschool. That was one of my responsibilities. And so I had to run interference when the construction equipment was too loud uh, for the preschool children. And I had to fight for different versions of the playground that had more play value than the original blueprint had. I had to regularly meet with the foreman and ask that he and his men curb their profanity around the children at least. A lot of things. But what I never anticipated was how utterly amazing it was to see that building go up from this trench in the ground to the top of that cross in the dome. It was like this divine symphony. Uh, And and I imagined the, the, the supervisor of the project, plumbing, foundation, not in that order, by the way. He'd do it in the right order. <clears throat> foundation, plumbing, heating. This, that, the other, uh, all these different things and and words that I'd never heard before. 
Um, and it was just like a symphony. It was amazing to me. Now, could that money have all gone for missions and other charitable projects? Of course it could have. But when that amazingly beautiful sanctuary was completed, I drew strength not only from worshiping with the congregation on Sunday mornings, and I drew immense strength from that. I grew faith and encouragement just going down into the empty sanctuary throughout the week, usually in the later part of the afternoon, nobody was in there. The sun was declining. And I could sit alone in contemplation before God, and it was glorious, absolutely glorious glorious. You want to come down to our chapel, to our sanctuary, to our fellowship hall, and pray alone to God in quiet? Come. Do it. We can make it happen. I promise you it will be unlike anything else that you do throughout the week. While we read that God's people uh, bring offerings in order to help build that beautiful temple. So let's look at this list here. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and crimson yarns, and fine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram's skins, fine leather, acacia wood, oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and gems to be set in the ephod, and for the breastpiece. Oh, and one more thing. And have them make me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them. In a world where crafts men and women made things, God asked them to bring their fruits of their labors. These things were their things of value. These were their offerings. People will give, you know, people will give generously when they are inspired. In the aftermath of the fire uh, last April 15th, at the Notre Dame Cathedral. Over a billion dollars was pledged for repairs during that first week. Over a billion. French President Emmanuel Macron announced a controversial, about a five-year plan to rebuild that many people praised him for. Where there is meaning, things of value, then money will follow. And that doesn't mean we focus, uh, the focus of the money is always, is always sacred in the things that money follows. But the world didn't only decide to rebuild the Notre Dame Cathedral because it's a beloved icon of the city of Paris and the country of France. Pilgrims, believers, also gave us a way to give offerings back to God for the opportunity to come before God, to have God in their midst at the Notre Dame. Offerings for churches, for temples, for missions, for ministries in the life of the church teach us all about generosity. They teach us all about self-discipline and self-sacrifice. Many of you in this room, probably all of you, have helped build churches and orphanages and schools and homes in the name of God, perhaps down in Mexico. So also craftsmen and women before you have brought their skills as an offering for the creation of those of the tabernacle. Antonio Gaudi, the creative genius behind the Sagrada Familia Basilica in Barcelona, said these words about those whose offerings of skill would eventually complete that church. He said, It is not to be regretted that I cannot complete the temple. I shall grow old, but others will follow after me. What must always be preserved is the spirit of the work, but its life must depend on the generations that pass it on and amongst whom it lives and is embodied. He was a devout Catholic, and that cathedral was begun, the building for it begun in 1882. They are still building it. I hear they hope to finish it in 2026, which is the a hundred-year anniversary of the death of Antonio Gaudi. So here's a question to ponder in your life here at La Jolla Presbyterian Church. What would be on your list as the best, that is the most worthy offering, you could give to Christ here in the life of La Jolla Presbyterian Church and our ministries?
What would be on that list? I leave you with that question about offerings. We turn now to the Gospel of John. We're going to look at the first chapter, which is uh, the most, one of the most amazing uh, chapters of anything, any literature, anywhere. And we're going to be reading verses 14 through 18. <clears throat> and the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. <clears throat> So John tells us that <clears throat> Jesus, the Word, comes to earth. He was with God, and the Word was God. This is earlier in that chapter. He was in the beginning with God, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. Or as uh, uh, Eugene Peterson says it, and moved into our neighborhood. <laughs> the Greek word here for lived among us is uh, skeno'o. And it's the noun, uh, the noun of version of that is skene, which is tabernacle. And Jesus is like the tabernacle. He's moving around. He's mobile, only a lot more so. Jesus, as God's presence, is both the new temple and the new covenant. It's Jesus who is now heaven on earth. <clears throat> Jesus is full of grace and truth. And from him, we have all received grace upon grace. How can we understand God's presence, God's coming among, among us? Well, our sense of God's presence in our midst can take a variety of forms. Sometimes they're awesome. Sometimes they're mundane. Sometimes they're gracious. Sometimes they're as maddening as a cat. But all are instructive. All are a revelation in some way. I'd like to bring up a different way uh, that God was in my midst, or maybe I was in the midst of God. And I would say that in this one way in which I experienced the great, this is one way in which I experienced the grace and the beauty of Jesus Christ. I mentioned a moment ago the Sagrada Familia. In the, in the summer of 2018, our family took the trip of a lifetime for us. And one of the things that we saw was this Sagrada Familia Basilica in Barcelona, Spain, or as they pronounce it, Barcelona. The first time I ever uh, had heard about it, it was in a magazine, and they were describing the outside of it, and they said it looked like a decaying tooth. And I was shocked, but then I, I looked at the pictures, and by George, it did look sort of like a decaying tooth from the outside. And since then, I've seen a lot of other pictures of it, and I decided that it was too fantastic not to see sometime before the day I died. And so we included it in our trip to Europe. Now, Europe is filled with cathedrals, and most of them are astounding. But I was totally unprepared for the reality of the Sagrada Familia. From the outside, it's one of the most bizarre and beautiful cathedrals I've ever seen. It's sort of this gray-brown exterior of some decaying teeth, extending into the sky, and there's lots of animals and fruits and clusters of vegetables sculpted inside and out, and, and lots of nature and, and biblical scenes, spires climbing to the heavens. They're not even done with it. There's going to be a big one, the biggest one, right in the middle of it, the Christ spire. Well, the day we went, Laura had arranged for us to uh, have headphones to get a guided tour. The moment I walked in, though, my jaw dropped. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want any speech to interrupt me at all. And Laura's kind of like, here, take these, please. I said, please, just let me see this. 
I just couldn't believe it. There were colors everywhere. There were ornamental pieces that looked a little bit like uh, bow tie pasta and stained glass windows everywhere, that all of the colors of the rainbow. And, and looking up in the, the, the ceiling of the Sagrada, I, I was so high, I got, I got dizzy. It totally delivered everything that I had hoped for and a lot more. Now, I realized um, that the money that built the cathedrals of Europe and probably many of the cathedrals in the United States as well could, yes, have been used to feed and save countless lives. And I get that God does not live in one place, in one church building. I understand that. But that day at the Sagrada Familia Basilica was one of the holiest days of my life. And argue with me till the cats come home alive at night, safe and sound. But God was in our midst in that cathedral. No question. The presence of God was overwhelming. And much as cynics love to preach that the cathedrals of Europe are dead, pilgrims like myself and my family still come to them to experience the presence of God, Jesus Christ, the Word incarnate, in a unique way. Now here's the biggest surprise of all. Since Christ lives inside of us. So now we as Christians are literally God's temples. We are God's temples. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 3. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? You want to know how mobile God's spirit is? Wherever you go. Wherever you go and wherever you went this week and last week and will go this week, God's Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost will be with you. And you don't even have to go to Europe to meet the Lord. So here's the question. Where are you taking God's Spirit inside you this week? Where is it going? And will where it goes Honor God. Buddy the cat is, for me, a visible sign of God's voice and God's presence, as maddening as that sometimes is. A cathedral can be an invisible sign of God's spirit. Each of us knows when we have been touched by God's spirit, and no one can take that from us. Wherever it may happen, it happened. So one final question. What if God was not in our midst? God was not present among us. Let me rephrase that. What would the world look like if Jesus was not here? Just take a moment to think about what would be different if our Lord was not here. You talk about love growing cold. The world would be a harsh place. We might not even still be here if the presence of the Lord was not already here before we had arrived. Friends, go make God's presence visible to the world. You are God's temples. I am God's temple. We are all the Lord's workmanship and God's spirit resides in us. So let us go this week and be the image of God. Be God in the midst of the world around us. Let us do that starting right now, today. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, before we arrived in this place, you were here. Your presence was here. Before this church, this beautiful place was built, you were here. But you abide in a way that serves to remind us every single week 
that you are in our midst, that we have come into your presence. Lord, we know that when we leave this place, you will be with us there too. We know because you are in us, we are now your temples. We are your tabernacles that go out, that are mobile, that take your midst into the world. So God, may you bless the world through us. And may we take that very seriously, Lord, in everything that we say and do, in everyone who are around, that they might know, yes, the Lord indeed is here. And yes, the Lord indeed loves us. We pray all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Thank you, Scott, and thank you for listening. The next installment of our concert series is coming up next Sunday, February 23rd at 4 p.m. in the Sanctuary. The concert will feature two incredible musicians, pianist Brian Verhoy, who is the primary accompanist for the San Diego Master Chorale, and violinist Danelle Gregory, who has performed with many symphony orchestras and concert venues such as Carnegie Hall and Disney Hall. Come hear these two incredible musicians next Sunday, February 23rd at 4 p.m. in the Sanctuary. It's a great opportunity to bring your friends. Also next Sunday, February 23rd, our youth will be hosting the annual Mexico Fundraiser Breakfast all morning. This is a great opportunity to enjoy some delicious breakfast tacos and pancakes and to hear about and help support the life-transforming trip that is such a blessing for our students. Finally, Interfaith Shelter is coming March 7th through the 21st, and we're hosting several individuals and families on a path to escape homelessness. We need your help with overnight hosts. If you'd be willing to spend a night at the church and meet these incredible guests, you can sign up online at ljpress.org slash interfaith shelter or contact John Mandrick. John's phone number is 858 483 9654, or you can email him at jonm360 at gmail.com. You can find a complete listing of what's going on around La Jolla Press on our website at ljpress.org. That's ljpres.org. Or call the church office at 858 454 0713. We hope you have a wonderful week full of many blessings, and we hope to see you soon. 